Hello Unity fans, it's time for part 1 of my series of videos in which I'm reviewing and also adding on to Catlike Coding's Hexmap tutorials. If you haven't seen part 0, the introduction, in which I'm basically just a big fanboy of this professional, excellent tutorial series by Jasper Flick, I'll link to it in the description. Or you can follow the link in the top right, right now. I'll also put a link to Catlike Coding's website in the description. In part 0, I introduce, surprise surprise, the series of tutorials and lay out a very high level summary of the topics covered, with footage of how it all looks when implemented. In the next 4 parts, I'll be diving in a bit deeper into each group of topics. Today, we start with the basics of creating and colouring the hexes procedurally as part of a single mesh. We will be adding some variability in the form of elevation and random irregularity. We will then create larger maps using one mesh per chunk and stringing meshes together. Oh, I remember how frustrated I was years ago when I could only allocate enough memory for about three times the screen resolution in Turbo Pascal. Not anymore! Next, we'll add properly behaving rivers and roads, and finally, a water level. Let's get going! The triangulation of the hexes works as follows. Meshes are constructed from polygons, more specifically triangles. Each of the triangles comprising the mesh needs to be specified, in our case procedurally. To accomplish this, a hex is divided into six triangles, and the three coordinates of each triangle are used to construct the part of the mesh that renders the specific triangle. Colors are also added for each point in the triangle, and the renderer interpolates between these three colors to render the triangle. To start off with, all three points of each triangle have the same color, which means the triangle would have the same uniform color. This leads to sharp edges between hexes, where the colors meet, which we want to improve on. Additionally, we want to be able to have varying elevations for our hexes, so that everything isn't on the same flat level. We cannot just jump straight up and down between hexes. And finally, we don't want these sharp regular hex cells. We want some irregularity to try and get a more natural look to the world. We can cater for all of these improvements by employing one basic change to our mesh triangulation. We split the hex up into an inner hex and an outer rim. The outer rim, which now has to be broken down further into triangles, is then used to raise elevation and to connect the neighboring hexes, blending the two together gradually. Irregularity is applied to break the sharp lines, although the coordinates of the inner hex is kept on the same height to provide a flat surface. These flat surfaces can be used to display most of the game objects, for example units or buildings. Of course, a lot of information needs to be stored about these hexes to allow us to work with them. We need to be able to identify which hex the mouse cursor is over, and obtain the neighbors in all six directions for any hex taking into account special cases. For example, hexes at the edge of the map do not have neighbors in certain directions. While the irregularities added to coordinates need to be random in some sense, they need to also be repeatable for any single coordinate on the map, since interaction between coordinates with indeterminate randomness will lead to gaps and discontinuities, which will not look good. The triangulation quickly becomes a lot more complex than the visual example I showed earlier, you can see here how terraces are catered for, and that the edges of the inner hexes are broken down into more than one segment each, to increase the amount of irregularity that can be applied. We also have a few parameters that can be changed to tweak the results. So you are able to change, for example, the size of each hex, the height difference between elevation levels, or how many terraces should be inserted when stepping up or down one elevation level. Since the code is written with customizable parameter values rather than hard-coded constants, any of these changes are applied seamlessly to the entire project. Map size is one such parameter. Meshes can only contain a limited number of triangles each. If we were limited to a map of size 1 mesh, we'd be doomed. However, by making chunks of 5x5 hexes each, we can cater for large maps. It does bring about its own complexities though. Chunks need to be combined seamlessly, and being able to determine the random irregularities become important again. A large map requires a camera that can pan around and zoom in and out. 
This is reasonably straightforward and it's again implemented with parameters that allow you to control rotation, speed, zoom extremes and panning speed. Large maps are also difficult to edit without larger brush sizes in the editor. By looping through hexes, taking care of special cases, larger brush sizes are implemented. The UI is also expanded to toggle labels and edit elevation and color separately. The triangulation gets even more complex when rivers need to cut through the geography. A straight segment of river is not that daunting, but when you consider all the possible combinations that you need to cater for, it gets really complicated. Many rules need to be adhered to, for example, not having rivers that flow to higher elevations. You also need to take into account the river's interaction with a lake as possible origin and with the water on the shore or estuaries. Due to the complexities it would add, rivers are not allowed to fork or merge. The visual representation of the water is obtained by adding another shader to the mesh. The same noise texture that was used to implement the irregularities in the terrain is now used to procedurally create flowing water. By sampling a thin strip of the noise texture and gradually moving the point at which the sample is taken, the effect of moving water is created. Here I actually tweaked the process a bit. You can see that in the original river, the foam or distortion on the water is a bit too linear from side to side. If we go into the river material, we can increase the X-tiling to reduce the straight lines. Increasing it to around 3 makes the river look a lot better. Because roads are bi-directional, unlike rivers, and since they are easier to visualize, we can cater for many more possibilities, including crossroads up to 6 roads per hex, one in every direction. It takes some effort to cater for the possible turns and connections, but you don't have the added complexity of having to cut through the geography. Roads also need to interact with rivers so that they can cross rivers and coexist on the same hex. When adding some noise from the same noise texture used for everything else, the roads acquire some irregularity. The final addition to the map for this video is the water level. Each hex's water level can be individually set catering for elevated lakes. Submerged cells for which the water level is higher than the elevation are rendered with an extra transparent water shader added to the mesh. Actually, two shaders are combined to create the water. Sine waves and two noise samples are combined into one shader for open water, while foam is simulated by another shader for the shore water. In addition, an estuary shader handles the interaction between rivers and water hexes. The baseland is now finally ready to be populated. In the next video, we'll start adding terrain features like vegetation, farmland and urban areas, as well as walls and special landmarks. We'll also replace the uniform hex colors with actual terrain textures and develop a system for saving and loading maps and managing map versions. Please like if you liked and subscribe to stay tuned.